Can you guys see my screen and hear me? Yeah, that's great, mate. So I'm, I'm just going to go on and mute for you now, Johan. But the screen's Fantastic. good. Fantastic. You're fine. Thanks, mate. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining in. Um, my name is Johan Cooper. I'm down in New Zealand. The big joke over here is that I'm presenting for Integration Monday, but it's actually Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m. So I'm going to be talking about this talk BRE today, and um, we'll kind of hopefully do as much of a deep dive as one can possibly do within a short time window. So before I start, just a big thank you to Mike Stevenson and to the BizTalk 360 team for organizing these sessions. It's just fantastic that we can kind of like dissect the global boundaries and get everyone together, you know, to do these sessions. So a little bit about me. I work over at a company called Datacom in New Zealand. I've recently worked on a book called Server Patterns with BizTalk Server 2013 and Microsoft Azure second edition. If you haven't read the first edition, definitely you want to take a look at this one because it's kind of interesting and covers a lot of uh, advanced topics in BizTalk. As Mike mentioned, I do quite a bit of blogging. My blog uh, site is called Adventures Inside the Message Box. I've worked on a framework called the BRE Pipeline Framework, which we'll cover today. And I've also kind of worked on a white paper for BizTalk 360, which is all about running BizTalk Server in Azure Infrastructure as a Service. And I'm a proud dad as well. All right, let's get into it. So what we're going to cover today, we'll start really uh, kind of, I guess, right from the beginning, start about the basics of the business rules engine, how it all works and fits together, and uh, just give you an introduction to what it's all about. We'll probably step high above that then and go right into kind of advanced topics about using the BRE and stuff, which even my, I myself haven't really used in production environments, but probably something everything needs to be, everyone needs to be aware of if they really want to use the BRE in anger. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the BRE pipeline framework, which as I mentioned is a framework which I've created in, uh, cr on CodePlex and used on quite a few production projects. And I think it would really be helpful for you guys if you knew how to use this and uh, see if it fits in with your requirements. So my goal today is a bit of evangelization. I know that the business rules engine is kind of one of the uh, less popular aspects of BizTalk, and it's kind of like a dark art. And I'd really like to help you guys understand that you know this is actually a good thing when applied correctly. And uh, disclaimer that I haven't used every single feature that I'm going to talk about today in a production application, but I have done my research, hopefully, and I'll be able to introduce you to all of these different topics. So a quick note that. All the source code for the demos, which I'm going to be uh, showing today, can be downloaded at this link, and I'll post a link to the presentation as well after the session. So before we actually get into it, why, why would you want to use the BRE? And I guess one of the biggest reasons is to decouple your business or processing logic from your pipelines and orchestration implementations. So rather than uh, hard coding the logic into those orchestrations, it's about putting them into a more flexible engine which is very easy to change at runtime without full deployments. So something to make quite clear is that it's not just about business rules like if uh, sales is greater than this, then profit is equal to this. You can also put an application logic in here. It's called business rules, but you can do, use it for more than just business rules. It's really fast. I mean, the entire engine's been optimized for speed, so you can definitely uh, rely on it to uh, execute very quickly. It's got versioning and source uh, versioning out of the box, and it can be source controlled as well. I think that's pretty important. And um, they've got the concept called vocabularies, which hopefully should make your rules easy to understand by anyone who's actually looking at the rules and the rules composer, or even better through BizTalk Documenter. It's part of your BizTalk server license, regardless of which uh, edition of BizTalk you're running, unless you're on the good old branch edition, I think. But um, you probably want to maximize your investment over there, so why not use it? And last uh, bullet point I've got over here is that even a business analyst can do it, but I put it in red and strike through because this is kind of one of the early selling points of the business rules engine, but I don't really know if this has truly been achieved because it is kind of, uh, I guess that a pseudo developer would at the very least have to be the one implementing these rules. There's quite a few development kind of mindsets one needs to actually implement them. And I'm not 100% sure that it's really well suited for a business analyst. But anyways, that's an opinion. So before we get right into actually creating rules, we've got to actually start with the building block of a rule, which is a fact. So a fact is a discrete piece of information whose characteristics are going to be assessed and updated within these rules. 
And the BizTalk Business Rules engine supports a couple of different types of facts. So it supports .NET facts, XML facts, or database facts. So when you're trying to think about what, what is a fact, from the .NET uh, perspective, effectively a fact is an instance of a class. So it's effectively an object. And it can be any object that you want to. Um, when you're talking about XML, effectively it's an instance of an XML message and the nodes within it. If you're talking about a database, it's effectively a handle to a connection to a database table. And the reason I've got cow, a cow on the slide over here is because I'm from New Zealand and we do a lot of work with dairy, so I'll probably use cows for a couple of examples this morning. So vocabularies, it's kind of one of the, I guess, uh, key building blocks as well. What they allow you to do is to abstract away the implementation of your fact characteristics with um, friendly terms. So, for example, if you're dealing with a .NET uh, member, you would have cow.color, but that doesn't read very nicely. So you could actually abstract that away with a vocabulary, which has a display name of the primary color of the cow. Now, you could also look at doing the equivalent for SQL, where effectively you're talking about select color from dbo.cow. Once again, you can abstract it away with the same display name, the primary color of the cow. So having a vocabulary hides the underlying implementation of your actual fact, and it makes, again, for really good reading. So there's kind of two uh, names that you use with any kind of vocabulary definition, and that's the name and the display name. So the name is just like a short, quick reference for what the individual definition is going to be. So for example, over here, we'd have get color as a name, and the display name would be the primary color of the cow. When you're trying to uh, deal with a vocabulary definition which takes parameters in, like say a .NET method with parameters, uh, for example, set cow value, um, the display name could actually be update the cow's value too, and over here you can see that there's actually a parameter over there. And then when you're actually uh, fulfilling these rules, at that stage you can actually insert whatever values you wanted into over there. So a vocabulary is effectively a collection of the actual definitions uh, which you're effectively abstracting away from the fact implementation. So I'll show you a quick demo on this. So I suppose I'll, what I'll do first is I'll introduce you to the actual fact ob objects which I'm going to try to create vocabularies for. The first thing I've got over here is a database called Animal Database, and there's a table called Cow. Very simple. It's got a couple of columns in the uh, one single table. What I've also got in Visual Studio. is a um, XSD schema called cow, once again with a couple of different elements in there. And thirdly, I've got a .NET class which is also called cow. And again, this assembly has been signed and it's been installed into the GAC. And that's a requirement if you actually want to have a .NET uh, fact available to the business rules engine. So we'll open up the business rules composer and let's create a new vocabulary. So on this side of the window, you'll see the vocabulary section. If you right click and say add new vocabulary, we'll just call this cow vocab. You'll see first of all that it's actually created a version underneath that vocabulary. So vocabularies are all versioned. If I right click in there and say add new definition, I'll get a window pop up which actually allows me to choose what type of vocabulary definition I'm actually creating. So let's start with the database one since I showed you that fact first. So the screen that's opened up over here is context sensitive to database. So if I'd chosen .NET or XML, I would have got some slightly different uh, text boxes over here. If I click browse, it actually asks me to provide details to actually connect to the SQL server in question. I'm just dealing with my local one in this case. And it asks me to reach out to the database in question the table in question, and the actual field which I want to deal with. So I'm going to choose color over here. So there's definition name, 
and I can just call this get color. And I'll say get color SQL just because I'm actually going to uh, create a vocabulary definition for get color for all the different types of um, facts in this uh, vocabulary. Down at the bottom, I can choose either set or get. I'll choose get in this case. By default, you'll notice the display name matches the definition name, but we can actually take this one step further and make this friendlier and say the primary color of the cow. So that's a SQL-based vocabulary definition. Let's try doing one for .NET. And you'll see that if I hit Browse Now, what effectively happens is uh, the Business Rules Composer loads up a list of all the assemblies that are sitting in the GAC. Something important for you to take note of is that if you actually put something in the GAC, uh, you have to close and reopen the Business Rules Composer to actually have it show up in this window because it loads everything in from the GAC when it starts up. So my cow uh, object, cow class is defined in this assembly. And I can expand cow and I can choose any of the .NET members or methods which are publicly available. So I'll choose get color. Once again, I can just say get color and I'll call it .NET just to make it obvious that that's a .NET one because there's not too much else that actually gives that away. And down here, I'll say the primary color of the cow. Okay, let's create an XML based fact now. So, XML document element or attribute. This time when I hit browse, I'm actually asked to select an XSD schema file. So I'll double click that and I can choose the element in question. What I'll do this time is I'll actually choose the value uh, element and I'll actually say set value this time just to show you the difference between a get and a set. So I'll choose set this time and the key over here is that uh, with the set it actually takes in a parameter because I obviously need to pass the value in which I want to set to this element. So I've got to build up an actual uh, display format string so I could say set the value of the cow to and dollar. So that's effectively what would show up in a policy if I was actually going to use this. So right now the vocabulary isn't saved so I can't really use it. So I'll save it. Even this, now that it's saved, I can't really use it just yet. It, while it's saved, I can still make edits to it, but I can't really use it at runtime. If I do want to start using it, I need to effectively go and say publish. The second it's published, it's now available for use. And just to show you what it would actually look like in a rule, say add new rule, and we'll just add a couple of uh, equals predicates just to demonstrate what these uh, definitions look like. So get color.net. Really, it's totally abstracted the way the fact that this is a .NET fact. If you click on it and actually look down here, you do get the details about it. But if you just look at the actual rule itself, you won't actually have that uh, detail in front of you. If I drag this over here, again, those two vocabulary defini definitions look exactly the same because it's hiding away the underlying implementation. Set value is going to change the state and really chances are if you're going to be uh, making changes to the facts, you really want to deal with those in actions, not in conditions, because it wouldn't make sense to really change the state of your facts inside a condition. So I'll drag that down to the actions section, and I can put whatever I want in here as long as it matches the expected type. What I could also do is I could theoretically actually drag vocabulary definitions to there as well, as long as they match the expected type. In this case, it doesn't because get color returns a string, whereas this expects an int, but that gives you an idea of what you could do. Moving on. So the next thing which we need to consider are rules. So rules are really what the business rules engine is all about, and they're made up of conditions and actions. So you can string together your facts and vocabulary definitions with relevant predicates. So a predicate is something like is equal to, is not equal to, um, is greater than, is less than, is in between, exists, stuff like that. So you can use those predicates and you can choose uh, vocabulary, vocabulary definitions to go on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of those predicates. Then you can actually build up your actions based on your vocabulary definitions as well. 
So an example rule would be set value for large green cows. Don't see too many of those around, so they must be really valuable. So a condition could basically say, if the cow's length in meters is greater than 500, and the cow's primary color is green, well, let's update the cow's value to well, a really large number. Can't tell you what, what it is, because there's no commas in there. So you don't have to use vocabularies in your rules. You could theoretically actually just use the uh, actual underlying fact implementation, like the .NET types and uh, XML types. But it, chances are that wouldn't make for very easy to read rules. I personally always use vocabularies. But if you look online, you'll see that there are some arguments against using vocabularies as well. And most of that comes down to difficulty with versioning. So the below would just be just as valid as the rule I showed you in the previous screen where you can see over here that it's actually directly showing that it's accessing cow.length in .NET uh, class, cow.color, and a method called setCowValue. So you could do that. I personally don't like uh, using this pattern. I personally prefer using vocabularies wherever I can, because I think it makes for much uh, better readability and makes it much easier for the next developer to come along and actually understand what you're doing. So policy is basically a collection of rules which will all be executed together. And the way a policy actually executes is that uh, the first thing that happens is all the conditions across all the rules in the policy will be evaluated. So before any actions are actually uh, considered, all the conditions have to be evaluated first. Once those conditions are evaluated, the business rules engine will fill out what's called an agenda, which is effectively a plan of which actions actually need to fire. and um, the order of the conditions being evaluated is totally non-deterministic, and you really have no control over that and shouldn't actually need any control over that. The order of rule actions firing is non-deterministic unless you actually specify priorities on specific rules. So by default, there's no determinism there, but you can actually enforce that. Order of actions firing within a rule is based on the actual order which you specify them inside the rule. And I'll kind of demonstrate this for you if that's not very clear yet. So there's three stages in the policy. Effectively, the first stage is match, which is where conditions get evaluated. And rules uh, are added to the agenda if all the conditions for that specific rule evaluated to true. The second stage is called conflict resolution, where based on priorities, those uh, rules are prioritized and the sequence of execution is decided. And the third stage is action, where the actions within the rules that are in the agenda are actually fired in the relevant order. So we're going to talk about assertion, which is kind of a, a really, really important concept in the business rules engine. So assertion is basically the concept of making a fact available to a policy's execution. So policy can only really deal with facts that it's aware of. So for example, if you've got some rules that uh, depend on a .NET fact, and you don't actually assert an instance of that .NET class to the policy execution, those rules can't fire because the fact is not available. It won't result in a runtime error of any sort. What will just happen is that rule will effectively be skipped altogether and will never hit the agenda. Other rules inside the policy which don't depend on the facts that haven't been asserted would uh, continue firing as they would normally. Now, it is also possible to actually enable static support for static .NET methods via registry key, but that's kind of, I guess, not normal behavior for the business rules engine. You can do that by adjusting the registry key, which is shown on the screen just now. And there's a couple of different values for different behaviors. I won't go into that, but you can come back and look at the slide if you want to. So. The underlying algorithm which the business rules engine uses to actually evaluate conditions and fire actions is called the REIT algorithm. It's a very fast and efficient way of evaluating multiple rules and creating an agenda. It's really all about sacrificing memory to get speed. And the reason it's a little bit heavy on memory is that it actually builds up uh, effectively a network of all of your different uh, arguments whereby you have one network for the left-hand side of all of your different arguments, and another network for the right-hand side of all of your arguments. And it tries to build like, the shortest route to actually join the two of them up. And it's really smart in that if, effectively, you've got two conditions in a specific rule, and condition one fails to evaluate, 
it's actually not even going to bother checking condition number two because it's smart enough to know that condition two isn't important in that case. So it's a really efficient engine. Um, it's really almost like the subject matter of PhDs. If you want to try to understand this, there's a lot of research you can do, and I'm not going to go too deeply into that, but it's something to be aware of. So I mentioned rule, prioritize, rule priorities to you guys already. So a priority can be assigned to a rule. So it's not two individual actions inside a rule, it's not two conditions, it's to a rule within the policy. The default value of a priority is always going to be zero, and as I mentioned, priority has nothing to do with conditions, just actions. The higher the value of the uh, priority, effectively the higher the priority of that rule, and higher priority rules fire before lower priority rules. So this is something which takes a little bit of getting used to. So if you've got a rule with a priority of one, it's going to fire the actions before a rule with a priority of zero. But what that effectively means is that a rule with a priority of zero could effectively override the rule with a priority of one because it's firing second. So it's just something to keep in mind that the high priority rules fire first, but that doesn't mean that they actually win if they've got conflicting actions. So we'll talk a bit about policy caching. So one more way that the business rules engine uh, optimizes its execution is by actually caching the policies in question. It does this uh, via a Windows service called the Rule Engine Update Service, which you guys might have noticed is always running in your BizTalk environments. And what the Rule Engine Update Service does is it effectively pulls the BizTalk Rule Engine database for new versions of policies and that poll is based on a regular polling interval. I think by default it's 60 seconds. When the Rule Engine Update Service finds a new version of a policy, it notifies all the host instances, and those host instances will then cache those uh, policies in their own internal caches. There's a couple of ways you can actually control this behavior through either registry keys or BizTalk config files. I've included a link over here if you want more information about that. Another important concept is the concept of side effects. So say you've got two uh, rules, and both of those rules are evaluating the uh, get color vocabulary definition for an XML fact. Once you've effectively checked get color in one rule, which you have to understand, you're running an export statement against an XML document, which if the XML message is large, is a relatively expensive operation. Chances are you don't want to have to repeat that export query in the second uh, rule. So what the rules engine will do is it'll actually cache the result after it reads that uh, the result of that vocabulary definition for the first time. And the second time it actually needs access to it, it'll actually read from the cache instead. So that's true for SQL and XML-based facts, but it's not true by default for .NET-based facts. And uh, the reason for that is that the business rules engine kind of has a default behavior where it considers that XML uh, objects might get manipulated in between, uh, uh, I guess, uh, assessments of the .NET members or methods. So there's no way you can actually control this behavior from the business rules uh, composer, but what you can potentially do is to actually manipulate the exported XML files for your business rules policies, search for uh, this side effects attribute and change that value from true to false for those .NET uh, members. And that will effectively change the behavior where it will actually cache the .NET members as well. There are some articles online which actually show that um, you can actually gain quite a bit of performance by doing this, but it all comes down to how complex your rules are, how expensive the operations in your .NET methods are. So it's something to keep in mind. And there's some further reading by both Charles Young and myself on this topic. So let's show you some demos. I guess the most important thing is how do you actually call uh, a business rule? So I'm going to demonstrate how you call business rules from both uh, an orchestration as well as a console application. And when I say console application, that's just what I'm using for my example, but you could effectively do it from any .NET application. Before we go too deep into that, I'll just show you what my rules actually look like. So I showed you my cow object 
my cow class, my cow database, and cow XML message. What I've done is I've actually built up some vocabularies for each one. For the XML, I've got get color, length, name, and uh, set value. For SQL, I've just got get color, get length, and get name. And for .NET, like the XML, I've got get color, get length, get value, set value. I've also built up a policy over here where basically I'm checking to see if the cow's uh, color is green and the length in meters is greater than 500. I've set the value to a pretty high number and I kind of repeat that for the different types of facts. With the SQL facts, what I actually do is I check the actual uh, name of the cow in the XML message compare that with, uh, join that with a record in the SQL database with a matching name, and then check the color and the length of that cow in the database and set the value based on that. So on the flip side, if the cow's color is brown or and the length is less than four, I set the value to a lower, lower number. So this policy can, uh, it expects facts of type XML, SQL, and .NET. Um, with if you assert an XML fact, at the very least, the XML uh, rules will fire if the conditions evaluate. If you assert a .NET fact, at the very least, the .NET rules should fire if the conditions evaluate. With the SQL ones, it's expecting both an XML fact as well as a database fact. So let's go into the orchestrations and show you how this works. So the first orchestration I'll show you is just the XML base one. So I've got an orchestration which is receiving a message in of type cow. And the next thing I do is I've got the call rules shape over here. So when you drop the call rules shape onto the orchestration designer, you get to choose what policy you actually want to call. So the drop down list over here will show you all the policies that are currently published in uh, the business rules engine currently. So you can't actually choose a policy that isn't, it doesn't yet exist effectively. You're only choosing from the list of policies that are already available. And what you've got over here, effectively, is uh, you can choose any variables or messages in the BizTalk orchestration which match the facts that the uh, policy is expecting. So if you've got a variable in your orchestration which doesn't match a fact that the policy is expecting, you can't assert that. You can only assert facts that the current policy version expects. You'll notice that there's no uh, real control in here to actually choose a policy version. The way the orchestration engine uh, works is that when you use the call rules shape, it'll always uh, call on the most recent version that is deployed of the policy. So after you call rules, what effectively happens under the hood is the call uh, is the orchestration will actually replace the reference for the cow uh, message with the updated version of the message. So it, it's one of the few uh, cases where a message can effectively be updated without a message assignment shape. And one would think that breaks the immutability rules of BizTalk, but really it's just a change in reference. It's not actually changing the underlying message. The original message is still preserved in the BizTalk databases, and effectively this is a new message, but the re I guess the pointer has been updated to point at this new message. Something else to consider is that when you uh, update an X or when you pass in an XML uh, fact into the call rules shape, is that because it's a new message, all the old context properties that were on the old message get lost effectively. So something you might want to do if those context properties are important to you is make a copy of the message before you actually send it to the call rules shape. So with SQL, there's a couple more considerations that you need to have. So in order to call a SQL, uh, in order to set a SQL fact into a policy, you actually need to create a couple of variables. So the first variable you need to create is a SQL connection, which is of type system.data.sqlclient.sqlconnection. And the second one is data connection, which is in the Microsoft.rule engine assembly. So you need to add an a reference to that assembly. Now these classes aren't marked as serializable, 
So you're forced to actually use an atomic scope both when you're actually uh, instantiating those uh, variables and when you're uh, actually asserting them and calling on your business rules policy. So if we look at this expression shape, you'll see that I'm just passing in a connection string to the SQL connection. In this case, I've hard-coded in my orchestration. It obviously would make more sense for you to actually read that in from a configuration store like an SSO configuration store or your BizTalk uh, config file, whichever one you prefer. And then I instantiate the data connection object. And when I'm doing that, what I effectively do is I uh, pass in the database name, uh, the table name, and the SQL connection object into the constructor for that class. When I double click on call rules, I can now pass in both the cow message that actually starts up the orchestration as well as the data connection. And then I'm just sending the cow message out. With .NET facts, I'm receiving the cow message in. I then um, instantiate my cow object and I'm just basically reading in distinguished fields from the income. XML message to actually uh, call on the constructor for my cow class. And over here I can choose both the cow object as well as the cow message if I wanted to, but I'm only going to pass in the cow object. I've marked that cow class as serializable, so I don't need to use an atomic scope in this case. And then I'm actually passing out the cow uh, object rather than the actual XML message and I've got some serialization rules around what namespace I've actually got on that cow class, but I won't uh, go too deep into that right now. So just a very quick demo of that. If I drop in the .NET trigger into this folder, which triggers off that .NET orchestration, um, first things first, there's a cow with a length of three and a color of brown. Uh, brown. If I look at the out, you'll see that I've actually got a representation of my cow class and the value's been updated to 50. If I drop in the SQL trigger, where all I'm actually passing in is the name of Bessie, and in my actual cow database, I've got Bessie as being uh, green and 5,000, so I expect that to be a valuable cow. If I drop that in, you'll see that the value is pretty high over there. So next thing I want to show you is how you actually call the business rules policies from .NET and what things are different when you actually do that. So I've built up this console application with a couple of different methods in here. So the first thing I'll show you is how you actually assert an XML-based fact. So first things first is you just actually go and create an XML document and load the XML into that XML document object. Next thing you've got to do is create an XML reader pointing at that XML document. Then what you're actually going to do is you're going to instantiate an object of type typed XML document. And this class is defined in the Microsoft.Rule Engine assembly. So once again, you'll actually need to add a reference to that assembly if you want to actually instantiate a XML-based fax. And what you're passing into the constructor for this class are effectively the document type and the XML reader. Now, that document type is by default the fully qualified uh, class name. And what's really, really important is that that document type must match up with the document type property on your actual facts, uh, your vocabulary definitions. So if you click on one of them, you'll notice that there is a document type over here. So as I said, by default, it's just the uh, fully qualified class name. But every now and then when you're dealing with schemas with multiple root nodes in them, this can get a bit more complex. So just make sure that when you actually define your vocabulary, that the def document type in here matches up with uh, the document type when you're creating your typed XML document. Right, so then I create an object array called facts. In this case, it's just got one en entry and I pass in that typed XML document into the fax array. I've got a method over here called execute policy and it just takes in an array of objects. 
if we take a look at execute policy, all it does is it instantiates a policy object, and that's also in the Microsoft Rule Engine, and passes in the policy name. Policy uh, also has a couple more overrides for the constructor, and the most interesting ones are the ones where it actually allows you to define what version number of the policy you're actually going to call on. So you can actually be a whole lot more explicit when you're calling your policy programmatically rather than from an orchestration by specifying which version of a policy you want to call on. By default, the constructor which I've got here right now will have the same behavior as the orchestration. And really, then I've got uh, policy.execute and I pass in the facts object array. So this is another differentiating factor between uh, policy execution and programmatically versus an orchestration. In an orchestration, I was bound by the actual uh, call rules window, which kind of smartly restricted me to only asserting facts which match the fact types that the policy actually currently expects. When you're doing it programmatically, you can pass in any facts that you want to to the policy. So you can kind of future-proof your application by passing in uh, objects which the current version of the business rule policy doesn't expect, but potentially a future version might. So you can actually future-proof it, and when you actually have a requirement to assess those further facts in the future, all you need to do is go and change the policy. Whereas if you're dealing with an orchestration, you'd actually be forced to go back to the orchestration as well. Nothing stopping you from actually calling the rules uh, programmatically from within an orchestration, but I suppose the most friendly way of doing it is through the call rules shape. So, after I execute the policy, what effectively happens is um, within my typed XML document uh, object, there is a member called document, and that will actually contain the updated XML document. So my original XML document actually doesn't get touched by default. It actually stays exactly as it is because it's effectively, from the BizTalk perspective, the message is immutable. So this document is actually the output uh, of the actual business rules. So I'm going to instantiate a new XML document and I'm going to target that document member of the typed XML ob document object. And then I can just go and inspect the actual values of uh, the value node to see whether my rules have actually executed correctly. So that's um, how you assert an XML-based fact. We'll look at a SQL-based fact. This is very similar to the experience which you have inside an orchestration in that all you're really doing is instantiating a SQL connection and a data connection. And in this case, I'm also instantiating an XML-based fact because my rule requires both an XML and a SQL-based fact to actually execute. And then You'll see over here, I've actually got an object array which has expects two entries because I'm now passing in the data connection as well as the typed XML document. And of course, I'm going to close that SQL connection when I'm actually done with my policy execution. So there's nothing different in the way I actually call execute policy. I'm just passing in the object array which now happens to contain uh, object of type data connection. And that's going to result in my rules firing for SQL. .NET facts are even easier to assert. So you'll see all I'm doing is I'm instantiating an object of type cow, calling in this constructor, and then I create my object array of facts, one entry, and I just pass in that .NET object directly and call, send it to uh, the policy for execution, which will update the actual .NET object directly. So I'll just... Uh, Oops, that's actually the wrong demo. I'll just change it so it runs this one. And you can see that it's assessed that um, the value is pretty high for these cows because um, in this case, the length was 5,000, color was green, etc. Right, so you've created your policies now and you want to test them out and see whether they actually work before you actually go to create your BizTalk applications and deploy them and actually test them at runtime. So what you can do is you can just right-click on your policy version inside the Business Rules Composer and choose Test Policy and choose to assert any relevant facts that you actually want to test the policy against. So you can directly assert an XML file or a database connection via wizard screens. 
but you can't really assert a .NET object directly. What you actually need to do is you need to make use of a fact creator class, which will do that for you. And I'll show you that through a demonstration. So something to be aware of is that if you assert a fact into uh, your policy test, those facts will get updated. So if you point it towards an XML message sitting on your file system, after you finish executing your policy, that XML message will actually get updated. So I'll demonstrate this for you quickly. So we've got this uh, policy version over here. If I right click and say test policy, it comes up with this window over here and it tells me what the different types of facts that it expects are. I'll quickly remove this because that's uh, what I'll show you a bit further on track. So for example with XML uh, documents, what I'll do is I'll quickly make a copy of one of the sample uh, XML messages. And if you take a look in there, the value node is currently empty. I can qu click on the XML document, choose Add Instance, and choose that uh, message over there. So what I'm effectively saying is that when I test the policy, I want to pass in this message as a fact. And if I hit Test now, first thing we'll do is let's actually look at that message. You'll see that there's now value in there. So the fact has effectively been updated. What you'll also see over here is um, some debug information about what actually happened inside uh, the policy execution. So you'll see all the conditions that got evaluated. So for example, in this condition, it was evaluating uh, an XPath query against the constant value bell, which is the name of a cow. And the left-hand side of the argument, which was the uh, XPath query, evaluated the Bessie. The right-hand side evaluated the bell so the test result was false. Same thing down here, XPath query which is linking to uh, the color element and testing it to see whether the value was green. In this case both the left hand side and the right hand side of the argument was actually green so the test result was true. So you'll see all the different conditions being evaluated in there and what you'll then see is um, which rules actually fired. So in this case, the only rule that actually fired was a rule called set value large number XML because that's the only rule which had its conditions evaluated to true. So likewise, I could right click and say test policy and I could come down here to database and click add instance and effectively just reach out to um, the actual cow table and if I test it, that would now make use of the SQL fact as well. You'll notice that if I click on .NET classes and click Add Incidents, it'll actually say, sorry, you can't do that. You need to use a fact creator. So I'll show you what a fact creator is all about. So a fact creator is just a custom class which implements the iFact creator interface. Again, this interface is in the Microsoft Rule Engine assembly, so you need to have a reference to that. And the implementation expects two methods. The first method is called create facts, which returns an object array. And it's pretty simple what this guy actually does. You just instantiate your facts just as you would in the console application I actually showed you. So I've got a SQL fact over here where I'm instantiating a data connection. I'm instantiating a type XML document over here for an XML fact. And um, I've also got a .NET fact up here. Then just go and create an object array, pass in all of the different facts into that object array, and return that. So effectively, my fact creator is creating all the different types of facts. I've also got another method, which is part of the interface called get fact types, which returns an array of types. So this time, what I need to do is I need to actually return what the various types of facts that I've asserted are. So in this case, I've got type of car, which is my custom class type of data connection and type of typed XML document. So once again, the fact creator assembly must be signed with a strong name key and inserted into the GAC to actually use it. If I go into the business rule com rules composer and I click on fact creators and add it's not showing me any classes which implement fact creator. And if I say test, 
you'll see that some rules have been fired in here because I actually had SQL, XML, and .NET uh, facts actually asserted. There's also um, uh, b uh, business rules engine test step in BizUnit 4.0, which you might be interested in using. I haven't used that personally because typically when I go to do testing of uh, business rules, I'll either use a pipeline unit test if I've had my business rule in the pipeline, or I'll use I'll test them using integration tests if the business rules were being called from an orchestration. I typically tend not to unit unit test the actual rules themselves just because rules by nature do change. So next thing we'll talk about is rules traceability. And rather than talk about it, I'm just going to straighten to show just to save on time. So you can't really get much debug information for rules when you're um, test. Oh, sorry, I'll take that back. Let's uh, first look at rules traceability from a console application. So I showed you previously how you instantiate the policy object, and I showed you that we had a we call policy dot execute passing in the facts uh, object array. There's another overload for policy.execute, which I'll demonstrate over here. And this one takes in a message which implements the I rule set tracking interceptor interface. So that interface basically allows for you to create a way to actually intercept your rules and write debug information out to the file system or wherever it is that you want to write it out to. Out of the box, Microsoft provides a tracking interceptor called the debug tracking interceptor class. So what I've done over here is I've just instantiated this debug tracking interceptor class, passing in the actual name of the output file. And what I've done is I've actually got the output file based on um, the policy name and the policy version and a GUID just to make it unique if I call it multiple times. And this time when I call policy.execute, I actually pass in the object array of facts and I pass in that debug tracking interceptor. So if I actually execute this now, um, you'll see that in CTEMP tracking, there'll be some extra tracking information. So you'll see that there's a couple of files over here, as I mentioned, the naming convention. And if you look in here, what you're effectively seeing is the same thing that we saw when we actually right-clicked on the policy version in the composer and chose test policy. Now, there's similar ways to actually get tracking information for your rules in uh, which are fired by orchestrations. And what you effectively do is you go to your policy and you've got to go tracking and you can actually choose to track fact activity, condition evaluations, rule firings, and agenda updates. So these tracking options will only work for policies that are actually fired by orchestration. If you want to do it from programmatic calls, you've got, got to actually programmatically call the policy.execute override, which expects the interceptor. So versioning and source control. So you can export your vocabulary or policy versions to an XML file using the business rules engine deployment wizard or the BizTalk administration console. With the BizTalk admin console, you can do a bulk export where you can export multiple versions of vocabularies and multiple versions of pol policies to a single file. But personally, I find from a source control perspective that it's probably best to actually export each individual policy and vocabulary version separately and to maintain them in source control and add them to your Visual Studio solution. Um, you can also associate a policy version with an application. And what that basically means is that when you export the application uh, to an MSI, the policy would actually get included in the MSI as well. Something else to be aware of is that if you delete a policy version using the BizTalk Admin Console rather than the Rules Composer, if it's the very last policy to be associated with a specific vocabulary, what will actually happen is the vocabulary gets deleted as well. So it's typically not a big deal if you've got a vocabulary that's only used by one policy, but if you've got a vocabulary that you expect to be shared across multiple applications, deleting that policy would effectively delete that vocabulary as well if those other applications aren't currently deployed. So one way to work around this is to create a placeholder policy that references all of your common vocabularies, which just ensures that 
those vocabularies will never get deleted. I'm going to skip that demo just because um, we're running a little bit short on time. We'll talk about engine control functions. So you might have heard about rule chaining before, and the whole concept of rule chaining is that you update a fact, and because you've actually updated the fact, you want all the conditions which run against that fact to be reevaluated. So I mentioned to you before that the order of execution of business rules is first all the conditions get evaluated, then the actions actually take place. So effectively, uh, rule chaining means that after we've actually gone and performed our actions, or at least some of our actions, we want to reevaluate the conditions which are going to be changed as a result of those actions being updated. So something to be aware of is that these sorts of uh, uh, functions can result in endless loops which could end up consuming all of your machine's memory. The business rules engine by default will have a maximum number of loops that actually will uh, go through before it throws an error, but it's a pretty high number. So just be careful and make sure you design your rules such that there won't be an endless loop. So the way you actually uh, enforce policy chaining is by using the assert or update functions, which you'll find in the functions vocabulary. And I'll show you how to use them. So I've got a policy over here, and we'll start with this one over here, this rule over here. So this rule basically says that if the cow's name is Bell, and the cow's value is between 20 and 40, change the value to 123, and then update cow. So this update function basically says that any, uh, any rules which have conditions which actually assess cow should now be reevaluated. So you'll see that the the priority on this specific rule is zero. There's two more rules in here. There's one rule with a priority of two. And this one says, if the cow's name is Buttercup, halt the rule. What this basically means is that the rule will stop, the policy will actually stop firing from this stage on. Any actions that have already happened will still have happened, but any further actions which are further down the agenda won't actually fire. Over here, if the cow's name is Bessie and the cow's value is 123, I'm going to actually retract that cow. So effectively, I'm going to retract the .NET object with a cow name of Bessie. If I had two .NET objects, one with the name of Bessie and another one with a different value, I would only be retracting the one of, with the name of Bessie. So I'm retracting a specific object in this case. And here I basically say that if the cow's value is 123, set the cow's value to 140. So here I was actually saying set the value to 123 and then update the cow. So if the cow's name is Bell and it's between 20 or 40, what I actually expect to happen is first it gets updated to 123, the cow gets updated, and then this rule over here will actually say, hey, the cow's value is 123, so I'm going to update it to 140. So let's fire off that demo just to prove that that actually works. And here we go. Bell's value is 140, even though if we actually look in here, Bell's starting value was actually 23. So the first stage was that it got updated to 123, got updated, and then it got updated to 140 in the second round of the rule chain. Okay, next thing we'll talk about is long-running facts. And the whole concept of long-running facts is that every now and then you might come across a vocabulary definition which is quite expensive to actually read. So think of effectively, I guess, a SQL um, query which is expensive to actually run because it's possibly an inefficiently indexed table or a .NET method which calls out to the WCF service where you don't actually want these uh, methods to actually get fired every single time. So what you can effectively do is use a fact retriever, which will decide whether it's going to use a cache version of a fact or whether it's going to uh, go and update a fact. So I'll quickly show you how this actually works. So I've created a class over here, which implements um, 
the iFact Retriever in, interface, again, in Microsoft.Rule Engine. And it's, it's just got one method called um, update facts, which is part of that interface. I've also got a second uh, private method in here that's not part of the interface. And the important object that's actually in the parameter list over here is called facts handle in. And you'll notice that the return type of this method is also an object. So effectively what fact handles in is is a token which you can actually assess to decide whether you want to uh, assert a new uh, fact or whether you want to stick with your currently asserted fact. So if fact handles in is null, that means that this is the very first time that this policy is actually executing after you've restarted your BizTalk host instance and that there are no currently asserted long-running facts. So if fact handles is in, in this case, I'm calling the instantiate and assert new cow method. And all I'm doing over here is I'm instantiating a new cow object and I'm saying engine.assert cow, which effectively asserts that cow object as a long-running fact. I then point fact handles out to that cow object. So fact handles out is effectively a token which I can assess the next time the policy actually gets called to decide whether I want to stick with the existing cow object or not. If we actually look at the cow class definition, in the actual constructor for cow, I've actually set a time created value and I've also instantiated a random number. So I can actually study when the cow object was actually created. And I expect that each time I actually create a cow, random value is going to have a different value. So now if fact handles in isn't null, which it won't be the second time the policy actually gets called, I can actually cast the fact handles in to a type of cow. And what I do then over here is I actually check to see whether the elapsed time between now and the time when the cow object was actually created is greater than 10 seconds. If it uh, is less than 10 seconds, what I can basically say is that fact handles in, uh, fact handles out is equal to fact handles in. So I'm not effectively making any changes whatsoever. I'm quite happy with the cached fact. But if the time elapsed is more than 10 seconds, what I'm going to say is engine.retract fact handles in. So I'm retracting the currently cached long-running fact. I'll instantiate a new cow object. I'm going to assert that new cow object and point fact handles out to the new cow object now, which will effectively have the new uh, random number and the time created. So just to show you a demo of how this works. So I've got an XML message over here. You'll see that uh, the value is zero. I've got a policy over here, but one very simple rule. The condition over here is one is equal to one, so this rule is always going to fire. And I say set the cow's value to that random number, which has actually been uh, assigned during the constructor for cow. Right Now if I actually click on the policy version, you'll notice that I've actually got a fact retriever configured over here. I'll just make a copy of that just so I can show you how you actually assign the fact re retriever. So I've just pasted a new version of the policy. If you come over here and click the ellipsis and browse, you can actually browse to the assembly in question. And then you can click on this drop down, which will show you a list of all the fact retrievers in, which are available. So let's drop this message in here. Wait for maybe four seconds. Drop it in again. So I expect that in the output folder that those two messages are both going to have the same uh, value because it's going to be reading in the random number which was generated for that cow. Now that hopefully more than 10 seconds has passed, I'm going to drop another file in there. And theoretically, there should be a different random value in there because now a, a new uh, object would have been uh, cached because more than 10 seconds had elapsed. Take a look. This one ends in 470. This one also ends in 470. The demo goes on my side. And this one ends in 788 because more than 10 seconds had passed. So it gives you an idea what long-running facts are all about. So deployment. You've got multiple options when you're deploying your business rules. I've already mentioned that if you associated your policy with a BizTalk application, when you export the BizTalk MSI, you can choose to include those uh, 
policies as part of the BizTalk MSI. That will also include any vocabularies that are, the policies are dependent on. You can alternatively just simply use the Business Rules Engine Deployment Wizard to import individual or bulk uh, XML files representing your vocabularies or policies. You can use BTDF, which can again uh, import your policies or vocabularies for you. And I'll show you a snippet of what the B relevant BTDF sections look like. Or you can actually use the BizTalk Administration Console to import uh, policies directly. It's a bit of a hidden trick because you can actually only access the import function under the All Artifacts application. If you're actually going to browse to an individual application and you click on the Policies tab, you won't see the import option. You'll only see it if you're actually in All uh, Artifacts. So some things to be aware of is that with BizTalk MSIs, um, or if you're importing uh, vocabularies or policies into the BizTalk Administration Console, what needs to happen is that the .NET assemblies need to be gacked first. The Administration Console then needs to be restarted, and then you can actually import those policies. The reason for this is that um, you can't import the policy or vocabulary when the .NET uh, class that represents those vocabularies don't, aren't in the GAC yet, and B, you need to restart the uh, BizTalk Administration Console because the console actually caches all the assemblies in the GAC when it starts up and it doesn't refresh that cache any, at any time until you restart it. So typically when you're dealing with a BizTalk MSI, the order of deployment is first you import and then you install. If you've got uh, vocabularies which contain .NET based facts, you might want to reverse that to be install and then import. A uh, problem which I've come across in the past every now and then especially when dealing with vocabularies with really long names and stuff, is that you might have your BizTalk MSIs fail because the way BizTalk actually packages the MSI, it creates a really long folder path for those vocabularies. If this happens, you might just have to create a fallback option where you use the BizTalk uh, uh, Business Rules Engine Deployment Wizard to actually import those policies and vocabularies instead of including them with the MSI. So always test out your MSIs on your dev environment just to make sure that they actually work. Um, something else to consider is that when you deploy your policies, you might want to consider restarting the rule engine update service before you actually start the application. Just because, uh, as I mentioned, the rule engine update service only pulls for updated policies on a set interval. So it's altogether possible that even after you start your application, the rule engine update service hasn't taken note of the fact that you've deployed a new policy version. And when something actually fires up your application, which is dependent on those business rules, it might find that those policies aren't actually available and you might have a runtime error. So restarting the rule engine update service after deploying your policies is one option, or you could deploy your policies, wait for that polling interval, then start the application. Alternatively, you can change the polling interval to be a really low value, but of course that's going to result in a performance hit. So I said I would show you what the BTDF sessions are. Um, if you're really interested, I'll let you come back to the slideshow. I'm not going to talk about that too much right now. So one of the things that really, uh, I guess, irritates people who've done business rules development is that once you've actually set a vocabulary to published or a policy to either published or deployed, you can't make any further updates to it. You've then got to effectively make a brand new version of that uh, policy or vocabulary. Alternatively, you could copy the existing version delete that version and paste in uh, that copied version and change the version number back to what it originally was. That's quite cumbersome and especially while you're in development and your policies haven't been finalized, that can be quite irritating. So one option you have is to actually go in and update the actual underlying tables for vocabularies and policies in the BizTalk Rules Engine database directly where you can update the end status column for your rules or vocabularies to a value of zero. So by doing this, you've effectively told the rules engine that these uh, policies or vocabularies are no longer published, and you can then go and make changes to those vocabularies or policies. So just remember, this is something you only ever want to do on dev. You don't ever want to do this on a real-life environment because this is effectively breaking all kind of rules of versioning. But obviously, while you're on dev and while your rules are still being developed, this is something which uh, can make life a whole lot easier. With vocabularies, you can then just go into the composer and right-click, save, and publish them, just like you would normally. It's not quite so easy with rules. If you try to actually publish or deploy your rule in the composer, you'll actually get an error message. 
So what you need to do is after you make your changes with your policy, after I'm publishing it, you need to save it in the composer, and then you need to set end status back to one. Another thing which you might be interested in is how you actually work out the dependencies between your rules and your vocabularies. Uh, this is especially important if you're trying to import a rule and you get an error saying that, hey, I can't import this rule because a dependent vocabulary doesn't exist. Or on the flip side, if you're trying to delete vocabulary, but you get an error saying that I can't de delete this vocabulary because there's still a deployed policy which depends on this vocabulary. So what you can do in this instance is look at this joining table which is uh, RE rule set to vocabulary links in the rule engine database, which actually shows you how vocabulary versions and policy versions are joined together. Right, so that's uh, got through the advanced uh, business rules engine discussion, and I'm now going to start talking about the business rules engine pipeline framework. So as I mentioned, this is a CodePlex project, and it's one which I've actually created. And the whole reason I created this was because I thought there was kind of like a gap in the BizTalk development stack where it was uh, kind of too rigid actually doing pipeline development, especially when you had minor changes to your conditions. And I thought, hey, a lot of what I actually want to do is conditional. And I've already got a conditional engine in the BRE, and I'd like to leverage that. So basically, the BRE pipeline framework is a pipeline component. I think orchestrations are really great when you're orchestration, orchestrating a business process of sequential or parallel steps, but where really you're using an orchestration just to introduce utility, potentially a messaging app only application is better suited, and this framework definitely encourages that. So some assurances on reliability of this framework. It's compatible with all versions of BizTalk uh, from 2010 onwards. It's based on .NET 4.0, so it won't work on earlier versions of BizTalk. And theoretically, there's no re reason why it won't continue to work with even newer versions of BizTalk. And I have been testing this quite thoroughly. Um, we've got a range of automated unit tests, which I run against all the different versions of BizTalk, and it's got around 94% code coverage, so it's quite thoroughly tested. Um, the commitment I've made so far is that all new versions in the 1.x version set will always be backwards compatible, so I always test for breaking changes, and the whole idea is that new versions of the framework in the 1.x version set will continue to enforce backwards compatibility. One day we might actually come up with a 2.0, in which case it might not, uh, older versions of our rules might no longer be compatible, but we haven't got there yet. We're currently on version 1.6 of the framework. It's had about close to 1,000 downloads, and only about 30 of those are me. It's heavily used in New Zealand, not just in the consultancy I work for, but also by one of our competitors, so that should say something. And on projects I've worked on, I can tell you that I've successfully used the framework on both low latency as well as high throughput solutions, and I've also used it on solutions that deal with large messages. So installing the framework is quite simple. All you got to do is go to the CodePlex page and download the latest version of uh, the installer, run the installer, which will import, uh, sorry, install all the required assemblies into the GAC and create a program files folder for you as well. Before you actually do the install, if you had a previous version, you would need to uninstall that previous version and then install the new version. If you had a previous version, you'd also want to restart the host instances so the new version actually gets loaded into the GAC. Uh, the installer doesn't actually install vocabularies by default. What it actually does is it creates a folder in your program files folder which actually contains all the vocabularies corresponding to out-of-the-box utility classes. So I'll show you what that folder contains. 
So what we've got in this folder is effectively a export for each one of the individual vocabulary versions that uh, are contained within the framework. But we've also got two bulk files. So this bulk file is called all vocabs and it contains every single vocabulary version for all of the different vocabularies. And this one's called latest vocabs, which only contains the latest version of each one of the individual vocabularies. So if you're dealing with a brand new site where it doesn't actually make use of the framework right now, chances are latest vocabs is the vocabulary that you want to actually import. If you're dealing with an existing site which has already had some rules based on the framework, chances are you want to use all vocabs. Alternatively, if you're interested in only one of the vocabularies, you can go and uh, import that granular vocabulary file. So some important terms to actually discuss. So the first one is execution policy. So this is the business rules engine policy that's actually used to assess conditions against your messages body or context and to likewise update your messages body or context. The second one is called an instruction loader policy. So this one is a secondary BRE policy and this one's an optional one which is only used to effectively assert uh, facts which aren't out of the box. So this is where you create your own custom .NET facts or if you're dealing with SQL or XML based facts. So if all you're doing is dealing with out of the, ba out of the box facts, you don't need to worry about an instruction loader policy. The only one you're interested in is an execution policy. The third one is an application context. So what I'd like you to think about over here is that you've got a BizTalk application with, let's say, 10 pipelines. And each of those pipelines is going to be using the BRE pipeline framework in it. Rather than having one policy for each of the different pipelines, you might want to actually contain all of your rules within one policy just to make things easier to maintain. So obviously each pipeline is going to have some individual behavior to it and you actually probably want to tell the business rules engine which pipeline actually is executing the policy. So application context is the way you do that. It's a parameter on the pipeline component which uh, typically all you've got to do is fill it up with the name of the pipeline or alternatively if you've actually got the pipeline component being used in multiple stages of the pipeline, you'd have the pipeline name plus the stage and then you can go and actually assess the value of the application context inside your rules. I'll demonstrate that to you shortly. So let's take a look at an example. So I've created a send pipeline over here and it's got the business rule uh, BRE pipeline framework component pipeline component over here. If you click on that, you'll see that I've set the execution policy parameter over here to integration monday.bpf demos. So that's basically just telling the pipeline component that, hey, this is the policy that you actually want to execute. You'll notice over here that I can ex actually explicitly state what version of the policy I want to call, but I've left it blank, which is just going to use the default behavior whereby the framework will choose the latest version of the policy that's currently deployed. What I've also set over here is the application context which as you'll notice just matches the pipeline name of SND underscore BPF demo one. If I actually look at uh, the business rules policy now, the condition in here just basically says if the application context is send BPF demo one, then write the value to the context property file or receive file name and the value is effectively made up by concatenating strings and the first string of the concatenation, concatenated result is basically based on the current time rounded up to 10 seconds in this format and the second string is .txt. So the pattern which you're actually seeing over here is effectively implementing rolling log files whereby every 10 seconds you're actually going to uh, roll to a new log file. So just quickly demonstrate that for you and we'll, you'll see in here it just says test1, test2. I've got my file send port set to actually append uh, files and to use the source file name as the actual output file name format. Wait for 10 seconds. For Actually before we do that, I'll just show you what's happened. You'll see that the actual file name is based on the current time rounded up to 10 seconds, so it ends in seconds 40. And if I go and drag a few more in here, 
you'll see that it started a new rolling log file now. And if I open that up, you'll see that it's appended the messages in there. So that's a quick demo of uh, a simple rule in here. So I'm going to talk about some more important terms. So the first term that you kind of need to be familiar with if you're really getting into the nitty gritty of the business rules engine pipeline framework, and it doesn't really matter if all you're going to be dealing with is out of the box uh, policies and you don't vocabularies and you don't really care how the framework works. That first concept is called a meta instruction. So it's basically a class <clears throat> that contains helper methods that you can then use in your conditions or actions to get details from a message. So almost all the vocabularies in the BRE pipeline framework are based on out of the box meta instruction classes and they can only be used in the execution policy. So you can't use a meta instruction classes vocabulary inside an instruction loader policy which you use to assert facts. You can only use them in an execution policy. Um, you can also have methods in your meta instruction that are used to actually instantiate an instruction and add an instruction. So what's an instruction? It's basically a class that's used to update a message and an instruction is just like a BizTalk pipeline component. It's in fact got the same signature as the BizTalk pipeline components execute method and you can effectively go and update the message's body or context in any way you want to just like you would in a pipeline component. So what's the architecture of the business rules pipeline component? It's effectively got the concept of the instruction loader policy, which allows you to instantiate custom meta instructions, XML facts, or SQL facts. The idea is you've also got a whole bunch of out-of-the-box meta instructions, which are instantiated and asserted for you automatically, so you don't need to worry about those too much. And those meta instructions effectively add instructions to a collection and all of those instructions will then go and update the message's body or context one by one. So I'll show you a couple of demos to give you an idea. So the first vocabulary that's kind of important is called context instructions, and this one is all about getting or setting context properties. So the vocabulary contains uh, definitions for uh, getting or setting context properties for all of the out-of-the-box context properties by enumeration. So you don't actually need to remember the actual context property names because you'll get a drop down that actually has all of the context property names in there. And likewise, you don't need to remember the context property namespaces. Alternatively, there's also a definition that allows you to explicitly specify property names and namespaces when you're actually going to get or set your context properties. There's also options in here to get or set, uh, sorry, to set context properties based on values read in from an SSO config store key value pair or from an XPath query based on the current messages body. Finally, another interesting one is that you also have the ability to remove a context property altogether from a message, if you so please. So I'll show you a quick demo of that. So demo two, you'll see that once again, I'm ass assessing the application context to see whether it's <clears throat> received BPF demo two and another part of my condition is where I'm actually checking to see what's the value of BTS message type. And if it's equal to this, demo2 message, that means this rule is going to fire. So if the message type was anything else, this rule wouldn't fire. You wouldn't get an error, but you wouldn't have this rule firing. And what the rule does is it's going to actually read in the value of this XPath query from the message, and it's going to write the value of that query to um, the file that received file name context property. So in this case, I've manually actually passing in the name and namespace of that uh, context property. What I'm then doing is I'm promoting the value uh, to the bts.operation context property, and this is actually a drop down. I can't show you that drop down right now just because that rule is the policy is already published, but I'll show that to you in a second. And for the actual value of that context property, I'm actually chaining another vocabulary definition in here. And this vocabulary definition is getting a custom context property where I specify the name and namespace. Here I'm actually saying, well, remove a context property. And here again, I'm just writing a hard-coded value to get another context property. So I'll just quickly make a copy of that policy just to show you what the dropdowns look like. Oh, wrong one, sorry. 
So as I mentioned over here, this is using the BTS namespace. If I click on that, you'll see every single context property in the BTS namespace is available for you to actually assess. If I actually look at the context uh, instructions vocabulary, you'll see that there are relevant vocabulary definitions for all of the different uh, namespaces for out-of-the-box context properties. So EDI, file, FTP, HTTP, WCF, etc. All of those are available to you. So the next vocabulary that's kind of interesting is called helper instructions. So this one, as you would expect, contains a whole lot of helper utility. So stuff like string manipulation, whereby you can convert strings from lowercase to uppercase, etc run regex queries to ex extract a substring from a message, perform find replaces against a message based on either regex or a set string, check to see uh, if a string contains a certain value or concatenate strings. What you've also got in here is the ability to perform dynamic transformation where you can actually run a map uh, conditionally. So this is kind of one of the gaps in this talk on uh, receive ports and send ports in that if you've got multiple maps with the same source schema, only the very first map which matches the source schema of the message being processed will ever be executed. You can't uh, insert conditions to actually say if a certain element inside the message is this, then execute this map or in the other scenario execute that map. So by using the business rules engine we can be more conditional about which map we actually execute. and. One thing that's also kind of interesting is that um, you can actually use the context access uh, pipeline component and uh, functoid on a send port as well if you use dynamic transformation using the BRE pipeline framework. So by default, the context access will only work on a receive port, but if you combine it with BRE pipeline framework dynamic transformation, you can actually use it on a send port as well, which can be handy. You can run XPath queries to extract a node's name, namespace, or value based on whatever XPath uh, query you want. You can choose to nullify the message, which is kind of handy when you want to get rid of a message altogether and just discard it. And there's stuff in there like generate good, round up time, which I've already shown you, which is kind of handy for rolling log file names. Tracing, which is really handy because you can actually uh, insert custom trace statements into uh, your business rules policies. You can throw custom exception messages. Um, you can get a value from SSO config store or you can cast between various uh, native .NET types like integer or string, etc. So quick demo over here. If we take a look at rule number three, you'll see that over here I'm saying that if the context application context is send BPF demo three and the substring to transform does not exist in the message body, I'm going to trace a throwing exception and I'm going to throw an exception with the detail don't want to transform this. Likewise, if the, a sub, the message body does contain the substring to transform, then I'm actually going to execute a map against that message body. So let's actually uh, run this demo just to show it to you. And this is the one which has the substring to transform. If we take a look, that's now of message type, uh, message two, whereas over here it was message one. Let's do that again, but this time let's actually turn on business rule component tracing just to show you the trace statement. So oh, that's using uh, ETW tracing based on the CAT instrumentation framework, and you've got to make sure that you're tracing based on business rules components, and you'll see over here transforming message. If I drop the no transform in there, the business rules engine would throw an exception as I expect. And if you look in here, there's a suspended message from just now, and you'll see that the reason is don't want to transform this, which is the custom exception message string that I actually threw from inside the policy. Um, there's a vocabulary called caching instructions, which um, is kind of one of my favorite patterns, really. So I'll give you an example scenario where you're calling a web service which takes in some request parameters. And when it returns a response, it doesn't actually contain the original request parameters. But from the BizTalk perspective, you want to actually pass on a response message to whatever the next stage of the process is, which contains both the request and the response parameters. 
So the way you typically implement this pattern is by putting an orchestration in the middle, which persists the original request, gets a response, and then runs a map which takes in both the request and the response on the source side and maps them to your target internal response message which contains all of the details. So the pattern I put in place instead is to effectively give you the power to cache context properties and then reapply those cache context properties on the response message when it actually comes back. So I use the .NET memory cache class for this which is specific to an app domain and um, what basically happens is that on the send pipeline you cache uh, either uh, specific context properties or all context properties, send a request to the web service, receive the response back, and then you can choose to reapply specific cache context properties or all cache context properties to the given message. So the key is that when you reapply context properties, uh, the vocabulary will take care of the fact, the correlation to the original request message for you, assuming that uh, you're dealing with a send port. It uses the bts.transmit work ID context property to actually perform this correlation for you and it just takes care of all of that for you. So don't, you don't need to actually worry about linking up the cache context with the original request. All cached items are set to automatically expire after 30 minutes, but you can also choose to re remove them explicitly and you can also choose to override that 30 minutes to be a shorter time or a longer time if you so choose. So I'll show you a quick demo of this. I'm going to call a WCF service, which is very simple. It takes in, it's got a method called add numbers. It takes an in, uh, input, which has two values, adds them up together, and returns a response, which contains a result only. So the response message doesn't actually contain uh, the original values. So We'll take a look at the actual rules which we're going to use over here. So the first rule will be on the send pipeline where I actually want to cache the context properties. And if the application context is equal to send BPF demo 4, I'll say add a custom context property with a name of that and that, namespace of that to the cache. If the context property is not found, I'm going to raise an exception. That's actually an enumeration where you could actually choose ignore and carry on if the context property is not found. In this case, I want to actually say that hey, those context properties are really important to me, so if they're not found, let's raise an exception. So you'll notice that I'm not actually choosing a correlation key or anything like that over here. The vocabulary does that all for me. On the flip side, when I receive my message, the response message back, you'll see that I've got write all of the cache context properties for the current message back on. So write is an enum over here. I could choose promote instead if I actually want to route based on those properties if I really wanted to. So what you can do now that you've actually reapplied those cache context properties is you can either use the context accessor to map those context properties into your message or you can use property demotion to get them into your message. So that's a really handy pattern. Next one is HTTP header instructions and the whole concept of this vocabulary is it allows you to get the individual values of inbound HTTP headers on uh, RESTful receive locations. It allows you to set individual outbound HTTP headers and also gives you the power to copy inbound HTTP headers to outbound HTTP headers. So the reason why this is kind of like a deal is because BizTalk actually takes all of the inbound HTTP headers and keeps them in one context property value which is separated by line breaks. And likewise when you're sending outbound headers it does the same thing. So really when you want to set individual HTTP headers you've got to go and manipulate this large string and this vocabulary takes care of all of that for you so you can actually deal with the individual headers that you want to actually deal with. So there's a little tip over here if you want to actually set outbound headers on a static send port set the bts.isdynamicsend context property to value of true. Um, I'll show you a quick demo of this one. So over here, I'm actually saying that this rule should only fire if the inbound HTTP header with a name of manipulate headers has a value of true. So if this header didn't exist or if it had a value of false, then this rule would not fire. So a couple of things I'm doing in here, I'm saying add or update an outbound HTTP header with a header name of test1 with a value of test value. So that's just hard-coded header name and hard-coded header value. 
I'm saying over here, copy the inbound header with a name of test header to the outbound HTTP headers. I'm now saying write the value of true to bts.isdynamicsend, which will mean that uh, I can set outbound headers dynamically on a static send port. And I'm also saying whatever the inbound HTTP method was, let's set that to the outbound HTTP method as well. So in this example, I've actually just got a send port which is going to go out to request bin. If any of you guys have dealt with request bin before, all it does is it captures whatever request you actually send off to it. So I'll just use Fiddler over here. I'll set manipulate headers to true. Let's change that to a put and let's say hello world over here. And if I execute and take a look in request bin, you'll see that one second ago it received a request and you can see that it's got those custom headers over there. Now if I go over here and I say manipulate headers is equal to false and execute that and refresh this, you'll see that it's called it again, but this time those custom headers aren't over there because the rule didn't fire. Along the same veins, there's also support for content negotiation in BizTalk 2013 R2 with the Business Rules Engine Python framework, but rather than being a core part of the framework, it's effectively an add-on. I've written a blog post and also have the installer for this add-on, and you'd have to follow that link to see that. Um, I won't uh, demonstrate this one just because of time constraints, but I'll tell you a bit about it. So there's a, a vocabulary called pipeline instructions, which allows you to execute BizTalk pipelines conditionally. So the pipelines that you can execute are XML assembler, disassembler, XML validator, flat file assembler, or flat file disassembler. So a good example of why you would want to use this vocabulary is for flat files which don't have tags uh, in the beginning of the file that actually help you identify what the files are but might have some sort of uh, pattern somewhere further in the file which would help you identify what the file is. So there's no way that you can out of the box probe the message to actually find out which flat file schema to apply. So what you might want to do is have a condition based on running a regex inside the message or searching for a substring anywhere in the message and then choose what document type to actually apply to the flat file disassembler when you're disassembling it. So that's an example of why you would use it. Something to be aware of is that if you're going to run a disassembler pipeline component through the BRE pipeline framework and there are multiple uh, body elements, only the first body element will actually be returned. So do beware, the BRE pipeline framework was not meant to be a disassembler for uh, envelopes with multiple bodies. There's a vocabulary called XML translator instructions and this one's all about um, basically modifying XML messages in a streaming manner. So it allows you to add replace or remove namespaces and prefixes on specified nodes, allows you to update element or attribute names or values on specified nodes, or to remove elements and optionally all child elements on a specified node. And again, this is purely in a streaming manner, so the updates to the message are made as the stream is actually being read. So it's a really efficient way of actually modifying your message, and in fact it's even more efficient than if you were dealing with an XML-based fact. There's a vocabulary called part instructions, which is all about dealing with part properties. So getting or setting message part properties, uh, getting content types or character sets or setting them as well, getting the names of your parts by index or getting part counts. So where this is really handy is when you're dealing with multi-part messages like my messages or emails and stuff like that. Okay, so an important thing to talk about now is how do we actually assert a custom XML fact. So the idea is that we need to actually use an instruction loader policy if we want to actually assert a custom XML fact which corresponds to the XML message which is currently being processed. So rather than talk too much, I'll actually show you. So we're going to look at this receive pipeline, and if you look at the framework component over here, you'll notice that I've also set an instruction loader policy. If we take a look at that instruction loader policy, what I've said is that if the application context is equal to this, 
and the root node name and the root node namespace are equal to this, then treat the current messages body part as a typed XML document of type that, which is just the fully qualified name of the actual XML schema. So all of these um, vocabulary definitions come from the BRE pipeline framework vocabulary and besides our application context, the rest of these can only be used in an instruction loader policy and none of the vocabularies, the other vocabularies which I've discussed so far can be used inside an instruction loader policy. So you've still got quite a few vocabulary definitions in this vocabulary that allow you to actually assess the message when you're actually uh, asserting your XML facts like regex evaluations, string evaluations, message body lengths, root node names and namespaces, etc. So there's a couple of things you can do over there. So once you've asserted that typed XML document with your instruction loader policy, you can then go in your execution policy and deal with the XML fact just like you would if you were calling that XML, if you were asserting the XML fact from an orchestration or um, from a .NET application. So that's fairly simple. There's also a vocabulary called XML instructions that allows you to manipulate your XML facts even further. So one of the painful things with XML facts is if you try to get or set a node which doesn't actually exist in the message, that'll actually result in a runtime error. So this vocabulary allows you to actually check to see if the nodes exist and if they don't to actually just instantiate them either with a blank or a default value. So that allows you to protect yourselves from scenarios where an element that you're expecting might not exist, which would otherwise result in a runtime error. You can only use this uh, meta instruction vocabulary if you're dealing with a XML fact. SQL facts are similar in that you need to use an instruction loader policy and again, you, whatever conditions were available previously for asserting an XML fact are also available for asserting SQL facts. If we take a look at the instruction loader, There are two ways you can uh, assert a SQL fact. From the BRE Python framework vocabulary, there's an add SQL data connection or add SQL data connection from SSO uh, vocabulary definition. So add SQL data connection, what it does uh, forces you to actually type in the connection string as part of the actual uh, rule action, whereas from SSO actually allows you to fetch the connection string from an SSO application. I tend to favor using this one if I ever do need to make use of a SQL fact, and that's what I've used in this rule over here. So you'll see that I've specified an SSO application name of integration Monday and SSO key of cow connection string, and I've also got to specify my database name and my database table for that data connection. And you'll see in here that I've got a connection string configured in my SSO application. Once you've asserted that SQL connection, you can make use of your SQL facts just like you would if you were, again, using the SQL fact from an orchestration. And you can assert as many SQL facts as you want to. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about extensibility. So I mentioned to you that you can create your own custom instructions or meta-instruction classes. Uh, as I said, an instruction class is very similar in its uh, signature to uh, BizTalk pipeline components execute method. So all you need to do is implement the IBRE pipeline instruction interface which you'll find in the BRE pipeline framework assembly. And that's just got that execute method, as I mentioned. You can feel free to add whatever properties or constructors you need to to the class. And in the execute method, you can modify the message to your heart's content. But obviously, to take normal pipeline component development considerations like streaming into mind. Meta ability, meta, meta instructions uh, are derived from the base class BRE pipeline meta instruction base again, the BRE pipeline framework assembly. And um, regardless of what constructors you build for this, uh, your class, the class will always be instantiated using the default constructor. So you probably don't want to bother writing anything other than the default constructor. Um, you can build any helper methods that you want to with any signatures into this class. And as long as they're marked as public, you can then go and build vocabulary definitions that correspond to it as well. You can access the actual message body or context via base.inMessage since the message, message uh, object is actually part of the base class which you're deriving from. And likewise, you can access the pipeline context from base.pc. You're not going to be able to actually modify 
the message inside a meta instruction and you should try to steer clear of actually trying to do that. So you can also build methods that instantiate an instruction instance and then you can use the base.add instruction method to actually add that instruction to the collection of uh, instructions to be executed. So the key here is you don't actually execute your instruction, all you do is add the instruction to a collection and the pipeline framework will actually execute the instruction for you. So how do you assert your custom meta instructions? There's two ways you can do it. Uh, method number one is by actually taking your fully qualified class and assembly name of your meta instruction and adding it to the parameter called custom meta instruction separated list on the pipeline component. So that's a com semicolon separated list. You can add as many meta instructions there as you want. Or the second option is by using the add meta instructions uh, vocabulary definition in the BRE pipeline framework in an instruction loader policy. It's probably easier to use the parameter on the pipeline component just because that means that it's one less policy to maintain uh, but do keep in mind that this function only uh, got introduced in version 1.6 so if you're using an earlier version of the framework that's not going to be available to you. So once you've asserted that custom meta instruction you can use the corresponding vocabularies in your policies just as you would with out of the box vocabularies. So I'll show you a very quick demo of that. If we take a look at um, the actual um, send port which I've defined, sorry, the send receipt pipeline I've defined over here, you'll see that I've actually got the fully qualified class name for my meta instruction class over there. Likewise, if you look at 9b, in this case, I've got um, an instruction loader policy specified. And if you look at the instruction loader policy, you will see that all I've done is specify the fully qualified class name and the fully qualified assembly name for that meta instruction. Let's look at the custom meta instruction just to give you an idea as well. So my custom instruction basically, as I mentioned, implements IBRE pipeline instruction, has an execute method, and all this one is really doing is setting the file receive file name context property to a value which I'm nominating. If we look at the meta instruction, I've got some helper methods over here which allow me to actually get or set uh, context properties in a custom namespace and it's doing it by enumeration. So I've actually defined an enumeration which contains all of the context property values over here and just like the out-of-the-box uh, vocabularies for getting or setting out-of-the-box context properties, you will see a drop-down in the Business Rules Composer for your custom context properties in this case. I've also got a method over here called set file name appropriately and what this one is doing is it's actually instantiating my custom instruction and it's calling base.add instruction for passing in that custom instruction in there and what will then happen is that the framework will execute that instruction in the order in which it was added to this collection. Last thing I want to talk about is how you can actually uh, trace and debug the pipeline framework because obviously that's pretty important. You don't want to get frustrated finding that um, when you're doing things they aren't working for you. So option number one which you have is um, on the receive location itself. You can go to your pi or to send port. You can go to the pipeline and there's a property on the pipeline component called tracking folder. So you just set that to a folder location. If I've set it as I have over here to see temp and I actually call on that demo and take a look in ctemp. What you'll find is that it's written out a file which um, first of all it's made up of the policy name, the policy version and a GUID and if you open that up that's effectively the same uh, output which you saw if you actually tested the policy inside the composer. So that's pretty handy because you can see what the condition evaluations were and which rules actually fired. And if a rule you're expecting to fire didn't fire, you can look at the condition evaluations to figure that out. If there was an instruction loader policy being called by the pipeline as well, you would actually have two files over here, one for the instruction policy and one for the execution policy. The second way of tracing what's going on is by using the CAT instrumentation framework and by tracing pipeline components. So previously I was tracing business rules components which allows you to trace your custom trace statements based on the help instructions vocabulary. 
If I just want to see the trace output from the pipeline framework itself, I've got to turn on tracing for pipeline components. And let's run trace for that. And let's run this demo again. And we'll stop the trace and we'll take a look. So you'll see there's actually a whole lot of information in here, like telling you what their various parameter values were when the pipeline got executed, tells you what the type of uh, stream for the message being processed was, whether the stream was seekable, tells you what meta instructions were asserted, whether SQL fact or XML fact was asserted, tells you what instructions were actually executed, and if the instructions contained any tracing statements, you'd see that here too. And lastly, you'll actually see the amount of time it took to actually execute the pipeline component, which is handy if you're trying to assess whether the performance matches your criteria. Something else important in here is you'll notice that every trace statement is accompanied by a GUID. And if we take a look at that GUID value, you'll notice that that GUID value matches up with the GUID value for the debug file containing your condition evaluations. So that's an easy way for you to actually correlate your cat tracing to these debug files. So there's a couple of things I haven't touched upon today which are also worth discovery but I'm not going to talk about them. You can define vocabulary definitions for constants. So if you've got a long custom string when you don't want to have that included in your policy, you can create a vocabulary to actually wrap that up and you can actually even make a vocabulary for a list of different strings and have it show up as a drop-down. I haven't touched upon how the ESP toolkit makes uh, use of PRE resolvers because I'm aware that there's been a recent session on the ESP toolkit, so I didn't want to talk about that today. Um, I've today talked about SQL facts based on uh, data, connection of data, data connection class, but you're also able to assert facts based on the type data table or type data row classes as well. And in fact, if you want to actually build a long-running SQL-based fax, you must use those classes rather than data connection. I haven't talked about that today, so you'd have to do a bit more investigation of your own. Also note that the BRE pipeline framework only supports data connection-based fax, not type data table or type data row at this stage. Um, you can also execute policies programmatically via the rule engine class.execute rather than policy.execute. And one of the handy features over here might be more academic than practical, but something to be aware of is that if you actually halted a uh, policy execution, you could actually choose to resume it if you made use of this class. And lastly, if you're dealing with complex XML structures and you want to build uh, vocabulary definitions against that, there's some additional considerations that you need to keep in mind. And I've written a blog about this, so rather than talk about it, if you want to, you can take a look at that blog post. So. That's everything I wanted to cover today, guys, so I'm happy to open up to questions now. Hi, Johan. Thanks for that. That was really good. I enjoyed that. Um, we've got a couple of um, questions on the forums. I'll, I'll